Isaiah, the 38th chapter. 38th chapter. I'm going to read verses 1 through 8. And then I'm going to skip down to verse 16. And read verse 16 through 19. If that's all right. And I'm reading from the NIV. The word of God says this. In those days, Hezekiah became ill and was at the point of death. The prophet Isaiah, the son of Amaz, went to him and said, this is what the Lord says. Put your house in order because you are going to die. You will not recover. That's what the enemy wants you to believe. The only problem I have with this is that it's coming from the Lord. <laughs> this is what the Lord says. Now, what the enemy says, what the Lord says, put your house in order because you're going to die and you will not recover. Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord. Remember, Lord, how I walk before you faithfully and with wholehearted devotion and have done what is good in your eyes. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Then the word of the Lord came to Isaiah, go and tell Hezekiah, this is what the Lord, the God of your father, David, says. <laughs> I've heard your prayer and seen your tears. I will add 15 years to your life. Somebody shout divine extension. And I will deliver you and this city from the hand of the king of Syria. I will defend this city. Wait a second. I thought he was praying for his life. He was praying for his life, but yet when God answered him, he says, I'm going to take care of you. You got 15 more years, divine extension. But I'm going to deliver you and this city from the hand of the king of Syria. I will defend this city. This is the Lord's sign to you that the Lord will do what he has promised. I will make the shadow cast by the sun go back the 10 steps it has gone down on the stairway. The NIV says, the King James Version says sundial, on the stairway of Ahaz. So that the sunlight went back the 10 steps it had gone down. <laughs> Verse 16 says, Lord, by such things, this is Hezekiah writing to God and responding to God's promise. He says, Lord, by such things people live and my spirit finds life in them too. You restored me to health and let me live. Somebody shout, God did it. Surely it was for my benefit that I suffered such anguish. In your love, you kept me from the pit of destruction. You have put all my sins behind your back. For the grave cannot praise you. Death cannot sing your praise. Those who go down to the pit cannot hope for your faithfulness. So he says, the living, the living, they shall praise you as I am doing today. And he says, I'll tell my children about your faithfulness. Beloved, for the next few moments we have together, I want to talk to you from the subject entitled, A God-Sized Opportunity. A God-Sized Opportunity. Let's pray. Spirit of the living God, we thank you for this moment, this divine opportunity to first be in your presence, Father, you are omnipresent. 
That means you are everywhere, but you're not in all things. And the fact that you choose to dwell with us means so much. <laughs> you are welcome here. Speak to us tonight like only you can. Give us a right now word. Somebody is in the midst of chaos. Somebody is in the midst of crisis. Somebody is in the midst of confusion. So, Father, send a word that speaks to everybody. Somebody needs confirmation. Let this word expand across the needs of not only this congregation, but everybody who is watching online and for those who will watch in the future. Do a new thing tonight. Holy Spirit, have your way. And we will give you all of the praise, all of the glory, and all of the honor in Jesus' name. If you agree, shout amen. You may be seated. A God-sized opportunity. Living in a transitional age is never easy. It's actually quite scary whether you are going from the industrial period to the technological period that we're in today or the information period that we're in today it's always scary and seeing reports and and concepts and ideas like artificial intelligence that we are told that uh, millions of jobs will be replaced by robots and we go to the grocery store, we see it every day. You go to McDonald's now and it's a robot taking your order. We talk about all of these things like it's our plight. And what is funny to me is that though we talk about jobs being lost, we never talk about jobs being gained. We never talk about the opportunities in the coming upheaval. Certainly there will be jobs lost because industries will begin to cut costs and so forth and so on, making it more profitable for their business, but they're still going to need a workforce to be able to do certain things, which means there is an opportunity for you to be upskilled, reskilled, and learn new concepts and do something completely different, but that can only happen if you are willing to let go of something called your preference. It can be quite scary because oftentimes letting go of what we prefer rather than what God has purposed becomes a hard task. And so we begin to prepare for the worst simply because we would rather not let go of how we think things ought to go. Some change comes into the world that whether you like it or not, how you think about it and whether you approve of it or not doesn't really matter. It's going to happen. I'm certain that there was some dude on a horse and a buggy talking about, I ain't never going to have four wheels. But guess what? Ain't no more horse and buggies no more. I'm sure that there was somebody talking about, I'm going to drive everywhere that I go. But, but when the Wright brothers decided that they were going to take a minute and believe for a God-sized opportunity to be innovative enough for man to fly, all of that was put to bed. In other words, there comes a moment during a time of opportunity where you have to choose to let go of what you prefer because if you don't, you will always have what you have always experienced. Yes, it is scary, but I know things are falling apart and that the future is unknowable and, 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 and all of that uh, 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 thing that you want to understand doesn't really make sense and cohere and, and we can't seem to put it all into order to make it fit where we want to be in our lives at this present moment. It's what some people call the postmodern panic and, and in other words, this lies beneath all of our cynicism and all of our anxiety and all of our aggression. There was a, a wonderful article that was written in the Atlantic that talked about why our country is so angry beneath the surface of everything. We're just scared. 
Why? Because everything looks uncertain. Everything looks like it's being shaken. But there's a scripture that comes to mind as it relates to this idea and concept that the Bible says in the book of Hebrews that everything that can be shaken will be. <laughs> it said everything that can be shaken will be. And the things that cannot be shaken will remain. The word shaken, if you study it out, is it's not a dramatic death kill to your dream, uh, to your endeavor, or to your future. As a matter of fact, the, the word shaken has a positive connotation to it. In other words, when something is shaken the way the Hebrew writer was talking about, it is suggesting to us that the things that need to fall off of you and be put behind you that weigh you down from moving forward has to come off so that you can have a great leap forward. Can you just look at somebody real quick and say, are you ready for a great leap forward? Now, if they didn't respond, if they didn't open their mouth, then possibly they're not ready for no great leap forward. So do me a favor and find somebody else that might look like they want to have a great leap forward and say, are you ready for a great leap forward? If I can argue this theologically, and before you call me a heretic, let me remind you that acceleration is not a violation of process. I'm going to say that one more time. Acceleration is not a violation of process. Every miracle in the Bible is a process that was accelerated. The reason why it is not a violation of process and it cannot be a violation of process is because there is a natural order to things. So when God said, let man have dominion in the earth, come on, I'm arguing theologically, he bound himself to a law that had to then get permission of participation from somebody in the earth for him to be able to move within it. Prior to us being in existence, when the earth was without form and darkness was upon the face of the deep, God didn't have to collaborate with anybody to fix it. He just allowed the Spirit of God to hover over the waters and then he said, let there be light. It was based solely upon his sovereignty and his authority of being God. But the moment in Genesis 126 and 127 when he said, let us make man in, my in, in our image and after our likeness and let them have dominion over the earth, it created, if you will, a binding of God's hands to be able to cooperate and participate with his creation that he created whom he wanted to be a reflection of him. Therefore, every other incident of God moving after the creation involves a person submitting and yielding themselves unto God before he moved. If you do not believe me, right there in the book of Genesis, we find God finding somebody when all mankind turned away from God. God found a man by the name of Noah, and he told Noah, there's a God-sized opportunity coming your way. I want you to start building. That's a word for somebody. I wish I had somebody in here. Uh, it wasn't like in Genesis 1 when darkness was upon the face of the deep and God just spoke. He didn't just speak this time. He had to find somebody, Lord have mercy, that he can connect with, cooperate with, and partner with to get his purpose accomplished in the earth. So Noah, start building. Why am I building? It's going to rain. What's rain, God? Don't worry about all that. 
Noah had never heard of rain before. Is it possible that God has you working on something that there is no precedent for and somebody is trying to talk you out of what you're doing because they cannot see what you heard? Who am I talking to up in here? Somebody shout, I got to keep building. I got to, I got to, I got to, I got to keep building because something is coming based upon what God told me. And God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. I believe what he said. I'm going to keep building. Somebody shout, keep building, keep building, keep building. I don't know if it's a business. I don't know if it's an idea. I don't know if you're writing a book. Keep building, keep building. So God then creates the partnership that's necessary based upon his word to have to collaborate with somebody in the earth for his will to be accomplished. I know that sounds crazy theologically, but, 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 but you have to understand the, the God that we serve wanted it this way. <laughs> this was part of his covenant harmony, his covenant purpose, the the, what, the goal of what he wanted to get accomplished in the earth. This is expressly why, I don't even know why I'm on this. I'm just, this is just intro stuff. But, 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 but this is expressly why that when Adam fell, that, that, that God says, okay, I have to get you out of this atmosphere because if I get you into this, if I keep you in this atmosphere and your creativity continues to kick in, then you're going to eat of the tree of life after already eating of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and therefore you're going to be eternally in a predicament that I cannot get you out of. This is why time is a gift to us. Oh, come on. I'm talking right. Son. That's why when you wake up every day, you ought to thank God for the time that you have, the 24 hours that have been given to you. Because guess what, baby? This is a word for somebody. There's always going to be another tomorrow. I don't care how bad it was today, there's going to be another tomorrow. Guess what? Sun's coming up tomorrow, boom. You're worried about the chaos and you're worried about the calamity and you're worried about the, 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 the news pundits and what they're saying on TV and what you're reading in the newspaper and, and you're worrying about all of that chaos, but chaos always precedes creativity. And when there's creativity, then faith proceeds great leaps into new things. Huh. Somebody get ready for a great leap. This is God's pattern, if I had time. This is God's pattern of transformation. This is God's pattern of transformation. And it be, always begins when things are all together. There's order. There's calm. Then all of a sudden, there's chaos. <laughs> all hell breaking loose. The moment you got the idea, the moment you took the action steps to put it into motion, the moment you said, God, I'm going to trust you. And I'm going to step out on this word and I'm going to start the business. I'm going to do the thing. I'm going to build it. Whatever your thing is, I'm going to make it happen. The moment you did that, you went from order to disorder, from order to chaos. I know I'm talking right to somebody. <laughs> and it wasn't you, but it was everything around you. People who normally wouldn't trip started tripping. Oh, y'all don't want to talk back to me. Family members who you thought had it together no longer had it together. Folk on your job you thought you were cool with started rubbing each other the wrong way. All hell starts breaking loose. <laughs> and it's one thing to experience all that, but it's another thing to experience it without a warning. Oh, y'all wish I had somebody to talk to. <sighs> and when it comes without a warning, it's coming with a purpose. Listen to me carefully. I want to give you this principle. This is just, a, just, just a, my intro. Here we go. It, whenever chaos and crisis comes into your life like that without warning, it's coming with a purpose. 
and the purpose that it comes with, watch me now, is to shatter your assumptions. Oh, help me, Holy Ghost. Y'all keep my car warm, okay? I might have to run out of the building after this word. It is, it is designed to shatter your assumptions of how you think things should work. It is designed for you to let go of your preference. Another way, in, in other words, we, we used to say this in church a lot. Any way you want to bless me, I'll be. See, you can't even say it now. <laughs> right now, you're talking about any way you want to bless me. I'll, I, guess I'll, I guess I'll take it. I guess I'll be satisfied, Jesus. If you want to do it like that. I am. But what I had in mind, you know, what I was thinking was. Oh, God, I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm on good ground right now. I'm on good ground. And you're talking about something anyway. No, you don't believe that. You want it your way. You don't want it any old way. You dreamt about it. You thought about it. You, 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 you had whiteboards and vision boards. I'm talking to somebody. And, and come on, somebody. And you had folk come over to brainstorm. And you said, it's going to go like this. And it's going to happen like that. And ain't none of that happening. And everything you thought was going to go down has been shattered, moved, the rug being pulled out from underneath you. But I got good gospel news for somebody because whenever the rug is pulled out from underneath you, there's still the floor. I don't want to preach too soon or punch too hard, but look at somebody and say, I'm still standing. I'm still standing. After all hell broke loose, I'm still standing. After I got the diagnosis, I'm still standing. After I was bedridden, I decided to get up, pick up my bed and walk. I'm still standing. My God, I feel a healing anointing moving in the atmosphere right now. If you're sick in your body, you ought to shout, I'm still standing and let healing come into your body wherever you are. Be healed from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. Your preference is a powerful thing that stands in the way of what God promised. Ooh. So God sends allows, puts us in the middle of crisis, catastrophe, chaos, uncertainty, to shatter the assumption of how we think it should work. And so then the only thing you're left with is your faith. Let, let me give you my definition of, 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 of faith. I know now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I, I get that. Faith is always now. Faith cannot be past. It, it cannot be future. It can only be present. Now faith is. Since faith is now, what faith is designed to do is not just to level the playing field. God has dealt to each man a measure of faith. So it doesn't matter the size of your faith because faith is power. It's not in the, in, in the thing that you're believing for, but in the one in whom you believe. So, so faith then is only as powerful as its object. In other words, have faith in God. And when you have faith in God, then you can say to the mountain, not have faith that you can move the mountain, have faith in God. It doesn't matter what you're going to speak to to move because really you know it's not you. Your faith is rooted in the God that you serve and that you know when you do speak, it's going to move. So here's my definition of faith. Faith is a predisposition to yes. Okay, let me explain. In other words, when your assumptions are shattered about how you think things should go, the first thing you're inclined to do 
when something innovative comes along that can move you forward in a great leap is to say, no. Whenever, whenever there's an opportunity for something to come that you did not think of, that you did not see, that, no, Lord have mercy, that, that, you, that you didn't even conceive of, the possibility that it could go that way, your first inclination is to not trust it. Okay? All right. Theologically, let me argue it because that's, you know, it's Bible study. So here we go. So, so, so there was a man who was, who was laying by a pool. The angels would come down, the Bible says, and they would stir the waters. Jesus come to the pool, and he looks at the man, and he asks him a question. Do you want to be made whole? Do you know what the man says to Jesus? Essentially, no. Why do I know that? Because his response was, I don't have anybody to put me in the pool when the waters are stirred. Now, Jesus didn't ask him nothing about why. He didn't say, why aren't you in the pool? He said, do you want to be made whole? And the man's response was, there's nobody because my preference is, since I've been being carried to the pool, why would you leave me almost there? So I got people in my life that are bringing me close, but not all the way. I'm preaching, I'm preaching, I'm preaching, I'm preaching, I'm preaching, I'm preaching, I'm preaching. I'm preaching. And so my history and my experience is teaching me to count on folk that cannot take me into my destiny and the fullness of my potential, but all they can do is leave me in the condition that I find myself in. And I'm still counting on them being disappointed every day. It had never entered into the man's psyche that there was a different way. Slap somebody a high five and say, there's another way, baby. Whatever way you think it's going to happen, there is another way. Whatever way you thought it had to go down, there is another way because my God has manifold wisdom. He can do it any kind of way. My God, I feel the Holy Ghost. I got to calm down. That's another way. That's a word for somebody. You're stuck right now and you're counting on people and they're letting you down. There is another way and it's called God's way. <laughs> Lord have mercy. My ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. God has another way. It had never entered into his mind that maybe he didn't have to get in the pool. That means your promise is not where you think it is. <laughs> that, 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 mean, that, means, that means there's a possibility that though you saw it, the seeing of it, maybe perhaps, was to get you to a level of letting go of your preference and saying, God, if you can do that, then however you're going to do what you're going to do for me, I believe it. It is the only reason to put you in proximity to what was promised, though you don't have it yet. And anytime you get into proximity to what is promised, even though you don't have it yet, you're close. And it's only there to strip away from you your preference so that you can actually step into promise. Jesus said, get up, pick up your mat, 
and walk, he never got in a pool. <laughs> that ain't my message. That's just free. He never got in a pool. He never got in a pool. So, 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 so. Understanding this, understanding this, I, 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 wrote, I wrote something down that's, that, that is important and, and powerful because I, I, I can't let this, this moment pass us by and not, not say it. We often begin to prepare our lives based upon our preference for a calamity that never comes. So what you have been preparing for will not have, Lord have mercy, will not have the catastrophic, the catastrophic power that it was intended to have in your life. What they have been saying, Lord have mercy, you might see it, but that don't mean you won't experience it. Oh, just let that lay right there. Come on, I feel Jesus in the room. So, 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 if we lay this foundation as a premise to understand that life's uncertainty, difficulties, crisis, calamities, and chaoses comes to do one thing, strip away our preferences, and leave us with one thing, our faith, to get us to a predisposition of yes. In other words, when you taste desperate enough, you'll say, yes, Lord. <laughs> I prove it to you theologically. <laughs> Jesus is passing Jericho. And there's a man by the name of blind Bartimaeus. Now, come on with me here. And, 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 and he's yell, yelling and screaming because he knows this is a God-sized opportunity. He realizes that Jesus ain't coming back. Lord, Hammer, this is a one time chance. So he's shouting, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy upon me. Everybody is telling him to shut up because they prefer quiet over your victory. I'm preaching better, y'all shout right now. Preach better, y'all shout right now. We see it in church all the time. Come on here, somebody. You start clapping and high-fiving. You get a revelation and start praising God. And somebody on your row go, oh. why? You want quiet, but I want my victory, baby. I'm sorry if you got nervous over my victory, but Jesus might not come past this way again. So Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. So you have to realize the Bible is filled with God-sized opportunities of people who let go of their preferences and decided, I'm going to have a predisposition to yes, and I'm going to risk whatever I need to risk to get the opportunity that God has for me. There was a woman with an issue of blood for 12 years. She sought many physicians without having healing. She risked her life of being stoned by coming into the crowd, contaminating everybody because she was deemed unclean. But this was a God-sized opportunity. And so she decided if I got to press my way, if I got to crawl through the crowd, if I got to get low enough to get to Jesus, I am willing to do it because this is a God-sized opportunity. And Jesus turned around and said, who touched me? You got to get into the posture where Jesus stops what he's doing and says, who just touched me? Somebody shout, I can't miss this opportunity. 
come hell or high water, baby, I got to get it. I got to get it. Whether it's being healed, whether it's being delivered, whether it's being set free, whether it's the meeting I've been waiting for, the interview I needed to have, I cannot miss this opportunity. A great and effectual tour is about to be open for you. And yes, there are many adversaries, but if you fix your eyes on Jesus, don't worry about the adversaries because you're still going to get the victory. This brings me to the text because the text is a Sunday school story laced within the context of a few narratives in Scripture. You can find it in the book of Isaiah. You can find it in 2 Kings. You can find it in the book of Chronicles. And it's, I, it's Hezekiah who is the 13th king in Judah. And he was one of the only righteous kings in Judah who restored worship back to the house of God, tore down the bell altars and brought Israel back to their center of worship and a posture of prayer. <laughs> and so he was deemed as a, a, a quality king, but the Assyrian king, Sennacherib, decided that he was going to seize Israel, and he had already seized Israel, the northern kingdom, and now he's coming to Judah, the southern kingdom, and he's going to lay waste to Jerusalem. And he writes a letter to Hezekiah, the audacity for the enemy to write you and hold you ransom. And he wrote him, and he says, pay me or die. And so Hezekiah says, well, I, I, I'll, I'll give you tribute to pay you to go away. And the Syrian king said, nah, we're coming anyway. So you're outgunned, you're outmanned. There's 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. You don't have the resources. You, you don't have the manpower. You are battle fatigued because all of your resources are being used just to keep it together. And for many of us, if we're honest, tonight we're battle fatigued because I've been fighting one thing over here and now all of a sudden, I got to turn around and fight this monster over here. Not to mention my own internal battles. So I'm fighting me. I'm fighting you. And now I got to deal with this boogaboo over here. I'm tired. I, don't, I can't win all of these skirmishes amidst the chaos and the confusion. And it's not like I can find somebody else to draw strength from because every time I call somebody, oh, y'all don't want to talk back to me. They're not only tired, but don't even have enough tact to ask me a simple question. How you doing? Oh, I'm talking better, y'all. Oh, you know I'm telling the truth. You know I'm telling the truth. And you get off the phone and you're more tired after you call the person for support than you were before you called. Am I talking to anybody? 
So he's battle fatigue. This, these aren't my points. This is just setting this up. He's battle fatigue. I'm going somewhere with this. He's battle fatigue. And he's tired. And, and, and he doesn't know how in the world he's going to win all of these skirmishes and battles. And he's a king. And he's got people to think about. And his kingdom to think about. And he's, he's, he's got a water supply to think about. And so he tells the men. And I'm just giving you the story to set it up. He tells the men, listen, we're going to cut off the water supply. If they're going to come, they're going to be in just just as much trouble as we are in because we're not going to give them access to our water. So we're going to cut off the water supply. That's prophetic. The reason why he had them cut off the water supply is because water is the life's blood of any living organism. And if you don't have water, you can't live. Water is always indicative of the spirit of God. Whenever you are in a lot of skirmishes, you have to cut off your water supply. That means don't give stuff access Access to your spirit. You have to guard your heart at all costs. Look at your name and say, guard your heart, baby. Guard your heart, guard your heart. Guard your heart. Why? Because out of it flows the issues of life. Guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it flows the issues of life. Every issue that you're dealing with, everything that you're facing is rooted down in your heart. And you have to keep your energy to the point that you can just have your heart in a good space and not have anxiety down in there while you are recollecting and dealing with the ideas and concepts up here to be able to make a decision for your next move. But remember the reason the crisis and the calamity came is to strip you from your assumption of how you think things should work and to get you to a predisposition of yes so that when God does speak to you you say yes Lord. Oh that's good, that's good, that's good, that's good. So now you're in a position to say yes Lord and that he can move you. David was in battle. Lord have mercy. David was in battle. And when he was in battle, he says, Father, should I pursue this troop? He says, should I go after them? We just suffered a great loss and a defeat. A few moments ago, he was in zigzag, the Bible says. And he was in great distress. And then God strengthened him and he got some victory. Now he's got the enemy on the run. And he is predisposed to yes. Why? Because of zigzag. I'm preaching to somebody. And so he says to God, shall I pursue this troop? And, and, and God says, not only shall you pursue them, but you're going to overtake them and you're going to what? Recover all. I dare you to high five two or three people say, get ready to recover everything. Every last thing the enemy took back from you, get ready to get it back and then some, your health, your energy, your vitality, your strength, your focus, your diligence, the vision you once held dear to your heart. Get ready to get it back. Your money, your time. Who am I talking to up in here? Get ready to get it back. This is a God-sized opportunity. Somebody shout, I'm about to get it back. I'm about to get it back. My Bible says, if the thief be found, he's got to return unto you what he sold and the increase of his house seven times over. He's got to give it back seven times and the increase of his house. So not only am I going to get it back, I'm going to get it back with a multiplier. I'm about to get it back exceedingly, abundantly, above all. My God, I feel like preaching up in here. I have not seen. Ear has not heard. It ain't even entered into your heart the things that God has prepared. Somebody shout, I'm about to get it back. They cut off the water supply and they have to dig all night to do so. If you got to dig all night, if you got to pray all night, if you got to fast all night, whatever you got to do to get it done, get it done. If you got to change your number, if you got to change the locks on your door, I'm talking to somebody up in here. Guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it flows the issues of life. Whatever you got to do, don't let that mess inside of you. 
Wake up in the morning and say, I will not be bitter. The root of bitterness will not fall upon me. Wake up in the morning and say, I'm not out of time and I am not out of options. It is not too late. I don't know who that is for tonight. God just said, it is not too late for you. That idea you had can still come to manifestation. You're not out of time. You're not out of options. Who is that for? Who is that for? You still got time. It can still happen. It can still take place. Cutting off the water was the key to his victory because the Assyrian army didn't have the means and the wherewithal to feed 185,000 soldiers. And so God was dealing with what was happening on the outside while he's also working on what's happening on the inside. <laughs> the threats that are external and the ones that are internal. And so when we step into the text, <laughs> he, he has already, <laughs> this is where it gets good, he has already defeated the Assyrians when we step into the text. That battle was over. Because the text picks up and says, in those days, <laughs> Hezekiah was ill, which means that what I just described to you had already taken place and was over. And God won that battle. Because the whole substratum of this text is simply this, the battle is not yours. It's the Lord's. Oh, this is good stuff. This is good stuff. This is good stuff. So, 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 Pastor Dobbins, when we jump into this text, and it says, in those days, King Hezekiah was ill. And Isaiah the king comes to him, and, 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 I mean, Isaiah the prophet comes to him, and Isaiah says to him, to the king, get your house in order, because you're going to die. What kind of mess is this? <laughs> no, dog, I just, no, no, you don't understand. I, no, yeah, yeah. can I talk to some real people just sitting there for a second? Yeah, you, dog, you don't understand. I just finished getting victory over an enemy that was trying to annihilate an entire race of people. And God did that. Now you come and telling me, get your house in order, you going to die? What we doing, Jesus? <laughs> Yo, I can't, I, say, I can't talk to y'all. I, I can't talk to y'all. Jesus, what we doing? <laughs> Ain't nobody got time for that. <laughs> the Bible doesn't tell us what illness he has. It doesn't describe his sickness. It doesn't give us a description of his plight. It doesn't give us a prescription for the illness that he had and what he was suffering with. It doesn't tell us none of that. He was sick. He was going to die. Get your house in order. And the king, I could go deep there, I ain't got time. And the king, the king, the king does one thing. He, he turns his face to the wall. Ah. Because he has learned just to let go of what he prefers. And so the first thing that he does is pray. And in his prayer, he doesn't say, God, this can't be. He doesn't say, God, no, you got to do something about this. He didn't complain about it at all. He said, God, I just need you to remember. You had a faithful one. You had a person that was dead. I just need you to remember. I'm going to cry about this, but not my will. Thy will be done. So he cries bitterly. And while he's crying, the Bible says before Isaiah got to the middle of the court, which means he left the king's quarters and got to the middle of the court, halfway out, the Lord spoke to Isaiah and said, turn around. 
go back and tell them you're about to have a divine extension. I don't know who this is for tonight, but God brought me down here to Wednesday night Bible study to say, turn around and tell somebody you're about to have a divine extension. God's about to give you more time. God's about to give you another shot. God's about to give you one more chance. God's about to do it again. Somebody said, I got an extension. I got an extension. It was due. I was late, but I got an extension. I missed the opportunity, but I got an extension. I procrastinated. Oh, come on, somebody. I break the spirit of the a procrastination in here right now. I procrastinated. But I just got an extension. So watch me now. Watch this, watch this, watch this. Here's where it gets interesting. He, he gets a divine extension. He gets more time. And so uh, Hezekiah said, that's cool. I'm cool. I love it. And, and Isaiah says to him, uh, well, there's more to the story. So Hezekiah says, okay, well, how can I know this is going to take place? And, and so watch this now. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. God says to Isaiah in 2 Kings, you can find it in 2 Kings. God says to Isaiah, ask Hezekiah how he want me to do it. Y'all want to talk back to me. Y'all don't want to talk back to me. Y'all want to talk back to me. No, 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 no. Ask Hezekiah how you want me to do it. What? I just finished a whole thesis discourse on you letting go your preference. Then God turns around and asks you what you want. Here's my theological argument. Delight thyself in the Lord, and then he will give you the desires of your heart. To delight means to become pliable. That means stop fighting them. Let go and let him mold you and shape you. If you let go of your preference and delight yourself in him, then he'll give you the desires of your heart so that when you do ask for something, it's aligned with what he wants for you. Is this helping anybody? So then he says to him, what, how do you want me to do it? Do you want the dial to go forward 10 degrees or 10 steps? Or do you want it to go backwards 10 degrees or 10 steps? Now, to give you some context to this, Y'all sit down. You scare me. Sit down. <laughs> to give you some context, I'm almost finished. To give you some context to this, a sundial could have been formed in a few ways, but ancient ingenuity uh, says to us or suggests to us that the sundial of Ahaz, which was Hezekiah's dad, he was, he was innovative enough to learn how to measure time by the sun and where the shadow of the sun would touch on a dial or a set of steps. In other words, they could have been steps like this, or they could have been steps centered in on a piece of metal that had grooves in them so that when the sun touched each space, you would know the measurement of the time of day based upon where the sun touched. History teaches us that more than likely that this particular sundial was probably configured and constructed with actual steps, with a hole that was in the top of, of, of a building and the light would shine through, much like Raiders of the Lost Ark, if you've ever seen that movie. <laughs> And then you would put an instrument in the middle of the floor and the sun would come through and hit the steps and it would show you the measurement of the time of day and whether it was morning or evening. And so based upon the timing of where they were, the Bible says that Isaiah says to Hezekiah, tell us how you want God to show you what he's going to do. 
And so Hezekiah says, well, I guess he can move it forward 10 steps. And then he says, well, 10 steps forward is easy for God to do because that would mean that the son would be in the control of his hand. If God moved it forward, it meant that he would move the position of the son. Well, we know he didn't do that because there's only one place in Scripture that tells us God touching the sun when the sun stood still so that Israel could win the battle. And so he says, I would rather him have the, the dial go back 10 steps or 10 degrees because that means that it is something that we control that God would then have control of. In other words, instead of him touching the sun, he would have to reconfigure the steps. <laughs> oh, yeah, I want to talk back to me. So that means when Isaiah said, I need you to do the harder thing, what he was saying was, I need you to go backwards in my day. If you're going to give me an extension forward, I need you to go backward. And to go backward, I need you to rearrange some of the mistakes I made along the way so that I can have the wisdom going forward. Somebody shout, he about to rearrange the steps of my life. For the Bible says the steps of a good man ah, are ordered of the Lord. So his prayer life changes his perspective on what he needs God to do. He doesn't need God to move in his future. He needs God to move in his past. Ah, I know God, you got me in the future. But baby, I have made some decisions I have hooked up with some folk. I have done some things in my past that keep finding me, causing my illness. And if you're going to deal with that, fix it all. Somebody shout, fix it all. My God, I feel the power of the Holy Ghost up in here. I tell you to touch three people and say, he's about to fix it all. If you're watching online, type it on the line. He's about to fix it all. Whatever all means to you, he's about to fix it all. Everything that went wrong, everything that went sideways, everything they said, everything they said you wouldn't be, you wouldn't have. He's about to fix it all. Help me, Holy Ghost. We're about to have our Holy Ghost break out up in here. Somebody shout, he's fixing it all. He's fixing it all. He's fixing it all. He's fixing it. The shadow moves back 10 steps. God is fixing it all. He's fixing it all. He's dealing with all of your shadows of doubt. Your shadows of difficulty your shadows of defeat. He's fixing it all. Can't you feel him fixing it all? You ought, to wave, you ought to put your hands up in the air and say, God, thank you for fixing it all. Thank you for fixing it all. While I'm sitting here right now in Wednesday night Bible study, you're fixing it all. You're going ahead of me and making the crooked places straight. You're going behind me because you are my rear reward. I wish I had somebody in here. You're fixing it all. He's fixing it all. He's fixing it all. That trauma you inherited because somebody didn't transform their pain, they transmitted it to you. He's fixing it all. That word that they spoke over your life that still is a blockage in your psyche, he's fixing it all. That broken heart you had from the disappointment and the setback you experienced, he is fixing it all. Somebody shout, he's fixing it all. I can't let this go because I want the Holy Spirit to do what he wants to do. He's fixing it all. And so, his prayer life puts him in a posture of letting go of his preferences 
so that God can position him for the promise he has in store because there is prophetic significance in what is taking place. Can I just go a tad bit deeper and then we're going to close this thing out. Where I find a difficulty in the text that had me stubbed was when the text says that Hezekiah has the sundial move backwards, but, 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 but then God comes to him and says, I, I'm, I'm going to heal you, <laughs> but I'm going to save this city. Wait a minute. The city was already saved. Because I just told you, he had already dealt with the Assyrians before Hezekiah got ill. But when Isaiah records it, he records it almost out of sequence, suggesting to us that God deals with the Assyrians, protects Jerusalem, but then prophesies and says, I'm going to protect this city and I'm going to deliver these people. That tells me, Pastor Robson, that he wasn't talking about the moment. He was talking about the future. Because it had been prophesied that the Babylonians were going to come and put them in captivity for 70 years. I'm preaching right now. And if you keep reading in the text, it was Hezekiah who welcomed an envoy from, the Bab from Babylon to see all of his treasury, and they came to see what they was about to steal. Be careful who you let in your house. That's just a sidebar. Anyway, 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 anyway. But, 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 but what I'm trying to get at here is that God then says to Hezekiah prophetically, I'm not just going to deliver you now, but I'm going to deliver you 70 years from now. That means I'm not just going to set you free, but I'm going to set your children free and your children's children free and everybody that you're connected to. I'm going to fix it. Oh, I feel like preaching up in here. I'm going to fix it all. Somebody shout, he about to fix it all. You worrying about your baby and them? He going to fix it all. Because it's in the blood now, now, baby. It's in the bloodline. You got the bloodline blessing now. And it's going down to your children and your children's children. Somebody shout, he about to fix it all. Let me bring this thing full circle. What are you talking about, preacher? I'm saying this is prophetically significant because he's saying, yes, yes, as I had prophesied to you, you're going to go into captivity. The Babylonians are going to come and lay siege to Jerusalem and everything is going to be destroyed. But one day it's going to be rebuilt. But I'm not worried about this city, this earthly Jerusalem. I'm more concerned about the heavenly Jerusalem. And I'm not worried about this earthly temple. I'm worried about the temple that's going to get up on the third day. That's why the Bible said on the third day in the text, Lord have mercy, God came to him and told him, I'm going to give you a divine extension. I'm preaching better than y'all shouting up in here. You got to understand that God is lacing his word with what he's going to do for eternity. That means if he fixed it for you, he's going to fix it all. That means everybody that you're connected to, who you're going to pass your inheritance to, He's going to fix it. And the way he's going to fix it is by giving them a God-sized opportunity. A God-sized opportunity can mean many things. But what it means is that there's something that can be done, but it cannot be done without God. Whatever that something is, you can't do it without him. You can't live without him. You can't exist without him. You can't run that business without him. You can't manage that relationship without him. You, can't, you know you can't parent these kids without him. 
I need you, Jesus. I need you to fix it all. And if you don't fix it, it ain't going to get fixed. But I lift my hands to you right now. And I turn my face toward the wall. And I say, remember God. I'm your partner here. I, I cooperate with you. I'm a conduit for your glory to flow through. So I yield myself to you. I need you, Jesus. I need you, Jesus. I need you, Jesus. Every hour, every second of the day, I need you, Jesus. I can't make it without you. I need you, Father. Come on, lift those hands and worship the Lord.